questions and let me know if there's something you don't understand, something that needs more explanation. But um, before we get into this mind, we're just, you know, Rav Gamarga said about the chauffeur that everyone should prepare a little thought. And when he was blowing the chauffeur, this is what came to me. Um, and if you want, you can repeat it, because <laughs> you have homework to do. But um, the chauffeur, the Balshanta gives a very beautiful mashal, an analogy. And um, it's my favorite one, so I figured I'll share it with you. And he says that, um, right, we know that the time of Elul and Rosh Hashanah is really the time where we really, it's focused on tshuva, right? It's focused on returning, right? Tshuva means to return, okay? I know we translate as repentance, which is an, another part of tshuva. But if you literally translate the word shav, right, means to return. And the question is, what are we returning to? Right, when you return somewhere, that means you were somewhere, you were there already, you went away and now you have to return. So what are we returning to? We're returning to who we really are, our soul. Okay, because before we came down into this world and before our soul was thrown into this body, into this chaotic world, right down here, it was really in a very good place and it was close to God and it knew who it was, it knew its worth, it knew its value, it's just pure and infinitely amazing, right? And it's divine, and it just wants to do what's right, and it wants to cling to God, and it wants to do the right thing. So every time sort of, you know, Rosh Hashanah Elul comes, it's like we're returning, we're reminding ourselves who we really are, right? And we're returning to that. We're, we're sort of realigning ourselves with the truth. So the Baal Shem gives a beautiful mashal. The mashal is a king who sent his son away. Um, um, and I can't remember if it's a punishment or whatever. For some, I, I can't remember. There are so many of these kinds of analogies, so it's hard to remember exactly why the, the child was sent away. But he was sent away, and he was sent away so far away for so many years that he forgot who he was. Okay, sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. Our soul goes through the same journey. And so he forgot who he was, and it's almost like he started dressing like the people, in, 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 like, like a peasant, and he even forgot the language that his father speaks. And, um, and then after many, many, many years, he finally decided, you know, I really want to return to my father. I want to go back. And he goes back. But the problem is that he doesn't look like the prince at all. He doesn't even know how to speak like the prince at all. And he's completely, um, he doesn't have a way to convince the guards of the palace to let him in. Because they're like, he's like, I'm the prince, I promise you, right? And he's like, not even talking their language, so they don't even understand him. And so they don't let him through. They don't let him through the gate. And so he's thinking to himself, "What? What could he do?" And he really tries every way to convince them, and they don't let him. Until, from all that pain and that yearning to want to go and see his father, you know, like when you're standing right outside the gate and you're just there. <coughs> so from all that pain and that yearning, he just starts crying, right? And he cries and cries. And one day, as the king is strolling outside his palace, he hears cries, and the cries sound familiar to him. He's like, hey, that sounds like my son. Sounds like my son that, I, that left me so many, so many years ago. And he goes out, and he finds his son, and obviously he recognizes him, and he brings him home. So the Baal gives us a mashal for the shofar. <sighs> Sometimes we're, and, and this mimer is a little bit going to focus on that. Our soul is yearning. And it really isn't a lot of pain, and it just wants to be close to God. But it forgot. It forgot the language. It, it's so far away. It's so lost. And all we can really do is when we blow the shofar, it's the cry of the soul. It's like we're not davening. We're not saying anything. We're not doing anything. We're just blowing a shofar. We're just crying. Literally just, it's the soul crying and saying, whatever it is, Hashem, just bring me back to you. And I want to come back to you. But it's like almost like I don't even know how to express it. But you have to be able to feel the pain of the soul. That's that's what we're going to discuss in this mimer. And um, so that that's what comes to me when I hear the shofar. So um, so that's a nice introduction to this mimer because this mimer, this discourse that we're going to be learning, is from the Balhatanya, right, the Alter Rebbe, the, the founder of Chabad Chassidus. He um, this is a very very famous discourse that I would say by now most of the world uses the analogy that he describes in this discourse for the month of El. Okay? And that is, anyone heard the, the verse, not the verse, like the expression, the king is in the field. Yeah? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is where it comes from. Okay, and I love to take things and go back to its source and see really, first of all, the context all around it, right? Where does it come from? How did, why did he bring it? And so on and so forth. So this discourse, like every discourse, is based off one verse from, from either Torah, from Tanakh, or from Medrash, from anywhere. And this discourse is for the words, Ani Ledodi, Ledodi Ani. What does it mean? So where is this from, by the way? Where is this verse from? Anybody know? Good. Shir Hashirim, right? Shir Hashirim is, um, was written by Shlomo HaMelech, and it's really a love story, okay, between, um, between Hashem and us. Um, it's the analogy of, of just really, really a love story. And so this verse, Ani Lidodi, is I am Lidodi to my beloved, Lidodi li, and my beloved is to me. The question is, though, why is this so popular for the month of El? Look at the first letter of each word, and what do you see? What does it spell out? El. Okay, it spells out the month of El. So it's on, right? Ani et lo. So the Alter Rebbe, what he wants to do in this discourse is he wants to explain to us what is the connection between Ani Lidodi, Lidodi Li, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me, to the month of Elo. Okay? What is the connection? And, and in a certain sense, I don't know where you're all coming from and what your past experience is, but in many circles, Elo is not a very lovey-dovey kind of month. It's more scary and like, you know, you have to repent and there's, you know, and it's interesting, and when it comes to the Al Rebbe, he like sort of totally show, like puts it out in a different kind of, um, uh, you know, mindset. And it's like it's really, really, really just, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. It's like recommitting ourselves to this relationship, and it's really beautiful because I mean, you tell me what emotions come up or what feelings come up when you. Think of this verse. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. What comes up? Like, can you describe any any descriptions? Feeling of closeness. Closeness. What? Comfort. Comfort. Closeness. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, yesterday we were talking about how during the month of El, our relationship with Hashem kind of changes, and it's more of when you pray, you should con- when you dog, you should consider it more of like. Like a friendship, and like your your versus like looking at like praying to the to the Lord, um, and so here when you say I'm to my beloved, my beloved is to me. There's like a commitment that your beloved has to you that's different than like what we at least what I think in, during other months. So. First of all, I love what you said, but I think that it should come with you to the other months as well, because <laughs> um, I think that it's. You know, the Rosh Hashanah means the head of the year, but it's the head of the year that sort of trickles into the rest of the year. We want this relationship with God throughout the year. This loving, trusting, did you say the word trust? Okay, I'm putting it in, but I think you said similar, right? Do you feel like I am to my beloved, my love is to me, there's trust, there's warmth, there's passion, yeah? And what better ingredients are needed in a relationship, right? This passage very much describes a very trusting, warm, committed relationship. The question is, though, where are we in this relationship, right? How, where do I find myself? Where's God in this picture? And so let's get into it, okay? Amazing. Ani Lidodi, Lidodi Li, Roshay Tebos. Roshay Tebos means it is the acronym. What? Yeah. For El. Okay? Veha Inyan. And the concept is. In Elo, we start this, this concept, this aspect of Ani Lidodi. I am to my beloved. Bechinas. So I'll tell you what, this word Bechinas, Beit Ches Yod. Okay, you have it in the full. I'm using a different format. The word Bechinas um, doesn't have an English translation. <laughs> Do you have an English translation for the word Bechinas? <laughs> Okay, it's one of those words that we can, I asked the smartest people in Chabad, 
Um, and maybe you can ask Rabbi Kaufman. I don't know. <laughs> He's like the next one that I didn't ask. But there's no word for Bechinas. But I'm going to try to... Bechina means the quality of, the aspect, the concept, okay? So the concept of Elul, the concept of this month, is Hisarusa de Lusata. Hisarusa de Lusata is a very famous concept in Kassidus. It comes up a lot. And there's Hisarusa de Lusata, Hisarusa de la Ela. What does that mean? Hisarusa means an arousal. De Lusata and de la Ela. So, de Lusata always means from below. And de la Ela, right, Aliyah, what's the same Shoresh? From above. So there's always this concept, like you can just look at a regular relationship, right? In every relationship, each one gives the other, right? It's never just one. It's like sometimes it comes from one, sometimes it comes from the other. What's beautiful about the month of Elul is that ani lidodi, right? Which one comes first? I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. Who's the I? That's us, right? So where is the arousal? Where does it need to start? From us. His arusa de la santa. It needs to start from below. Okay, we need to show interest in God. We need to tell God, God, I'm searching for you. God, I want to return to you. Okay, it needs to come from below. Isn't that our maid? Yes, it is our maid. It's arusa de la santa, right? In Elo, we have this concept of an arousal from below. Until when? Ad Rosh Hashanah, the Yom HaKippurim. Shehem hamshachas el akuso yizbarach lamata b'bchinas yizgalos. Now, in Elul, we show an arousal from below. What does that always result in? If we show interest in God, what does God do? He reciprocates, right? So what happens is, is that then Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur come. So what happens? On Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, hamshachas el akuso yizbarach. Now what's being drawn down is a revelation of godliness, lemata, down here, the chinas is galos in a very revealed kind of way. Kemaisha Kasov, like it says, smoilei tachas l'reishi v'yeminei techapkeni. Good morning. Smoilei means his left hand, tachas l'reishi, is under my head, v'yeminei, and his right hand is hugging me. Okay, this verse comes from a medrash, which describes, it's like a whole interesting story, but it is describing a relationship. And um, the, the Yemini Tachas Leroyshi is referring to the left hand that is under the head. The Yemini Tachas in its right hand is hugging. So we have to understand that in this whole month, there's a lot of things that are happening. So we have Elul, which is like the overall month. Then we have Rosh Hashanah. Then we have Yom Kippur. And what comes right after Yom Kippur? Another holiday. Which one? Sukkot. Sukkot. And what's beautiful here is that this entire thing is describing a relationship. It's describing um, a sort of like recommitment, realignment. So what's Elul? Like we just described. What's Elul? Good. It's like we're. Uh, it's like arousal, right? And it's almost like. He's going to describe God comes into the field. He lets us see him. He lets us know him in a very mundane kind of way. So let's put it as the dating process. Okay? Make sense? Dating is where we get to know each other. Right? Rosh Hashanah is where we actually, what do we do? Get engaged. Exactly. We say, God, I want you. Right? That's Rosh Hashanah is when we crown God as our king. So that's the engagement period. Okay? What would Yom Kippur then be? Good, the Yichud, right? The Yichud room. You know, in Jew, uh, by Jewish wedding, what happens right after the chuppah? The, 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 the chassan and kala go into a room, and that is their Yichud. They're together alone. That means they're married. That's Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is so holy. God takes us into his, into his innermost chamber, and it's almost like we become one, literally. Right, another thing Yom Kippur is, if right, everyone says is a day of atonement. Another way to read it is at one minute. A day where we literally become one. That's Yom Kippur. And Sukkot is what happens after the Yom Kippur and the Chassan and Kala come out, and what do they do? Dance. They dance. 
Yom Kippur is when we literally just dance it all out because this is the most joyous, um, most exciting thing in the world. We just developed a relationship that is so meaningful, so deep, right? And gives us such a pleasure that we just dance it all out. So the, the, the reason why I'm writing this out, because in this mimer he brings this pasuk that his left hand is under my head, that's Elo, and Yamina Techapkeni, that his right hand is hugging me, what do we know about the sukkah? It's how many wolves does the sukkah have to have? Three and a half. Good, three. And you're right, it's two and a half. It's two and a half? It's two and a half. half. Yeah, but most people do three. Oh, yeah. It's almost right. like a hug. Okay, that's what we say in Hasidus, that the sukkah is where God is literally hugging us with his right hand. So Elo is the left hand under the, under the head. Sukkot is where it's the hug. That's when we dance, and that's when we celebrate. But we're going to focus now on Elo. We're going to get to Sukkot later on in the year. So Elo is this time where his left hand is under my head. V'yemine t'chapkeni. Shemirei shashana ad yom ha-kipurim hu bechinas smaylei. Reish Hashana until Yom Kippur, it's the aspect of the left hand, which is what? Bechinas Yira. Lefi, why? It's the concept of awe and fear. Lefi she'az, whose man has galus machuso yizbarach. Because this time of Elul is especially designated as a time where God reveals his kingship. Now, let me ask you a question, right? A king. So it's really hard for us in a certain sense because we don't live in a time of kings, right? By the way, it's very interesting. I heard this from more than one person. And they said that the, the Alter Rebbe a lot uses the concept of kings, also in Tanya and over here. And the reason, they say the reason is because in his days, that, that was the reality. And not only was it the reality, it's so funny because we're really, I don't know, maybe you're more connected to it because you come from, like, I don't know, is it like more like you come from a place where like where kings used to be? Used to be, but also like I feel like Putin is a dictator kind yeah, of kind of person. Kind of. Yeah, it's <laughs> you need to say like in America you don't fear the president. Of you don't yeah. have to say there's no mm-hmm. so but you have to understand in those days when they had czars and kings, people literally walked in the street trembling. They had this fear and you should know that I feel, I don't tell me if I'm right or wrong, I feel that a, re- a big reason why we struggle nowadays, especially youth, with the concept of awe and authority and fear is because we don't really have this concept so much in our life. But it's very important. The Alter Rebbe and Chassidus, it's like, that has to be the foundation. Yira has to be the foundation. You can't have love without fear, without awe. What? So you have to fear first. Yes. Now... I don't, I don't mean fear as in a trembling fear. I mean awe as in a commitment and to know that God is my king and I am under his kingship no matter what. Okay. That concept. So it's, it's, it's a commitment. Think about it. A marriage, imagine two people, and people do this all the time, and that's why there are many divorces. Um, two people decide to get married because they love each other, right? And there's a lot of, you know, they are in love. There's a lot of beautiful feelings but they're not committing to this marriage. It's almost like, okay, and then what happens is that love comes and goes, right? All these feelings come and go. So the minute that that sort of moves aside, if there's no commitment to the marriage no matter what, no matter how I feel, then what can very easily happen? The relationship falls apart. So the commitment is very, very important, okay? Yes. Uh, so it says like this, this kind of small, like this feeling of awe, it's about 10 days? Because it says it's like Yes. Okay. So that's, it's, that's it really the, starts, in, it starts now. It starts now. It starts in Elul, and the blowing of the shofar is there to remind us. It's here to, why, why? A very simple reason is that when they used to, when they used to crown a king in the olden days, how did they crown a king? By blowing the shofar. Okay, it's, it was part of the ceremony. They used to come together. You learn it in, in Nabi, right? When they, when they anoint David as king, or, or, right? What do they do? They came together. They came by water, and there's reasons why water, and they blew the shofar. So it's also getting us into that mode of, am I committing myself to this relationship? Am I ready to crown God as my king? And it's, 
full Kabbalah's El Malchus Shemayim. What does that mean? Accepting the yoke of heaven upon myself. Now, I want to tell you something. What's a yoke? In agriculture, they, they did put the... On the first, like the... The, the cow. Yeah. I, I've seen it on oxes and yeah. cows. What's a yoke? That, they're working and they put this like... Semi-circle. Yeah, they put this like huge thing on them so that they shouldn't get distracted and focus on their work. Now, is that comfortable? Mm -hmm. No. Now, I don't mean to sound like... I just wanted... I wanted, like, let's be real. Let's talk about this. Like, okay... Accepting the yoke of heaven is is something that we need to decide if we're ready to do. And it's a commitment, and it's not easy. It's not. It's not always comfortable. I think that it gets more comfortable when you can come to a place where you understand that it's good for you, and that it's going to strengthen your relationship with God, and it's only going to make it more meaningful and more powerful. You understand? But to think that it's easy, that's not true. <laughs> right? Yeah. Were you mind repeating that Hebrew What? Kabbalah's own Makhus Shemayim? Yeah. Kabbalat. I'll write it on the board. Kabbalat means to receive all the yoke of Makhut Shemayim, the kingship of heaven. And it's interesting because if you see, it, it, it uses the word Kabbalat. What does Kabbalat mean? To receive. What does receive mean? You have to receive it. No one's putting it upon you. You have to receive it. Okay. I mean, Hashem is putting it upon us, but like, the question is, are you are you committing yourself to it or not? So how did we get into this? Okay, so we got into this because we said that Elul, the time of Elul is the left hand. Now, what do we know? God has, so to say, two hands, right? There's the right and the left. Right always represents what? Chesed. Chesed, kindness, love, right? And the left hand always represents Gevura, which what comes out of Gevura? Judgment, awe, respect, boundaries, authority. That's all in the side of Gevura, okay? Now, the concept of Elul and Rosh Hashanah is the concept of Malchus, Malchus, kingship. Now, let me ask you a question. So this is where we sort of got tracked off, but I was going to ask you this question before. The concept of a king, right? The concept of a king. Is it, what comes to mind at first? Reverence, awe, yeah? It's not the, you see, it's more like, it's not the, the father-son kind of relationship, right? It's not the love kind of relationship. It's much more of a... Power, so much. Right, power, um, you know, commitment, um, respect, okay? Um, so that is really what's happening in Elul, even though we'll see that it's really a very positive thing, but we have to know that it's kingship, and we're going to crown God as our king, okay? Um, Vilachem, okay, um, you have it? Vilachem, and therefore, Kairin Hamelech, this is why we call him the king. Ki malchuscha malchus kal oilamim. Because God is the king of all the world. Okay? So there are many worlds, okay? And we all feel it. Even the highest worlds feel this kingship of God. Obviously on a different in a different level of consciousness, but they also feel the concept of God as king. Um Piresh Shafilu Elamin Tafel Aleim Amos Hamalak Upakadai. Even in the very, very high worlds, right? Tafel aleim, it falls upon them, Amos Hamelech, this awe of the king, Upachadai, and his fear. Umizet, and from there, Nimshach, Gam Lemata, it is also drawn down below, Al Klolos Neshamis Yisrael, on the general soul of the Jews, Lekabel, to be able to receive. Oil Matha Shamayim, the yoke of heaven, Alayim upon them, Vitiya Yirato, Al Pineyam, Kol Hashana, and then his awe and his fear will be upon them the whole year. Ki Yirath Hashem Baavato, Eno Asuya, Vinatuya Baleva Adam, Mikoch Atmo. The fear of God and the love of God is not made 
and it doesn't rest in the heart of a person from his own koach, from his own energy. It comes from this energy, from this light that rests upon him from above. Okay, we just said something very, very big. Okay, what? So it doesn't sound like a Isar Sadala Eila. It sounds like Isar Sadala Eila. Gorgeous. I knew that question was going to come. The problem is, the question is though, what came first? We're describing now Rosh Hashanah. Before, we're talking about El now, before Rosh Hashanah, we have to come out to the field and show interest in God. After we show interest, you're right, it really all comes from God. Nothing comes from ourselves, but we have to show interest. You have to start initiating. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's true, God is the one, like this whole mushal that, that he's going to say that God comes out to the field, the king comes out to the field, and it's, all, it's one of those days where it's like not official, he came to me, I don't have to go to him, I don't need an appointment, I don't have to wait online, I don't have to wait three years to get into the king's palace, he's coming out to me, that looks like the Sarusa de la Ela. true, it looks like God is coming towards us, but the thing is that many people could hear that, God, that the king is in the field and they could stay home. Right? They're not going to come out. So we need to come out. We need to show God interest. And then, true, I love it. I love what you said because really, really the truth is, and this is a key to success in life, is that nothing comes from us. It all only comes from God. Even our fear of God and even our love of God comes from God. We just need to want to have it. We need to sort of want to tap into it. That's, that's the key. But to think, to ever think that I work on my love of God, and that's why I love God, that's like, that's like missing the point. And it's almost like the author of it says in a different discourse that it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to last. Because it's really, right, we learned it on the side. It's not yours. You think it's yours, it's not yours. Okay? What's on that one? The love and fear that you produced or you think you make, you make towards God if you think it's yours, then it's not going to last. Okay. Right. Which a lot of people experience. It's something that bothers people a lot. Like, you you know, you go to, like, some kind of event or you've been somewhere and you feel so inspired. Right? And then, like, a day later, it's gone. Right. And you're like, hey, what happened? Because it wasn't really... It wasn't real. Okay? Um, so... So what's he saying? He's saying that you know the world. Do you know the world? Let's start from the beginning. Oh, can I erase the board already? Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So Chazidus teaches us that there are four worlds, okay? And obviously, each world is going to take us lower down, meaning to say more concealment, more contraction, so that we feel God less and we feel ourselves more. And that is... Atsilos, Bria, 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 she knows it already. I forgot the youth one. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. The, 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 this is the hint, Abiyah, okay? So the world of Atsilos is the world of emanation. Over here, it's where really it's Ein Sof. The Aren Sof is God himself, okay? Then we have Bria, the world of creation, where God starts to create Right? And therefore, uh, so in the world of Bria and Sira, we have angels. Okay, we have angels. Angels are both, there are a few angels that are in Bria, most are in Yitzira. Yitzira is formation, the world of formation. Asiya is the world of action, that's our world. So what happens as we go down? What happens? Right, exactly. It's, okay, Asilos is emanation. Creation, Bria is creation, Yitzira is formation, Asiya is action. So there are two things that happen as the worlds progress. This is called, by the way, Seder Ashtash, it's called the, the process of evolution. I don't like to say evolution because people think monkeys, no, that's not that kind of evolution. I mean evolutionary process of how things progress, okay? So in the world of Atsilas, where it's, it's just the God's light himself, right? So it's it's the, the the level of consciousness is what? Godly, okay? And then in Bria, what happens is two things. There's contraction and there's concealment. You know the difference between contraction and concealment? Okay, 
So contraction means that the space of how much light is coming through is getting smaller, and concealment is a curtain. So let's say over here there's a lot of light, and I take a piece of wood, and I put it in front. Okay, I'm gonna erase this because I wanna pretend like the wood is in front. Yeah? Are we clear? Yeah. Is the wood in front now of the light? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I make a hole this big. So now, a little less light is coming through because there's wood here, mm -hmm. right? That's contraction. I'm taking the light, and I'm making it a smaller space to come through. The size for contraction, God sort of hangs a curtain in front. So now, not only is there less light coming through, but there's like a veil that's covering over the light. Okay? What? That's concealment. That's concealment, right? So now, think of it this way. As we go down into the world, there's going to be a thicker curtain and a smaller hole. Less light, more concealment. To the point where we live in a world of action where we're walking around, living our life, and some people deny the fact that God even exists. And who's giving them life? God. But God makes it in a way that it's so concealed and so contracted that I can think that I actually give myself life. I can completely forget about God in this world. I can look at this table and think that it's just a table. It's really godliness. It's just I don't see it. I don't perceive it. My, my, our level of perception is really, really immature. Okay? And what Hasidus wants us to do is to put on spiritual glasses and to start seeing and feeling the world a little bit, slowly, slowly. Sometimes we have Bria moments. Atilas and Tani says almost nobody goes there. But we can have Yitzira moments. We can have Bria moments. Okay? Where we feel we have a, a deeper consciousness. We feel godliness in a much more realistic, tangible kind of way. So what is he saying here? He's saying that God is a melech, by the way, whether we choose him or not. Yeah. Um. Where would you put like the rabbi in like this list? Because you have different people in different levels, like where would the rabbi be? Yeah, you're right. Every soul comes from a different world. Mm -hmm. True. So I don't know where the rabbi's soul comes mm -hmm. from, but... Um, no, but like based on how much you see and stuff. Right. So tzaddikim, mm -hmm. mostly, they say, um, it says in Tanya, I think it's either from the world of Bria or Atsilas. Okay. okay? Um, so, so what do you mean they come from different worlds? Like yeah, every soul has a different amount of potential in what it, it you know, that it, Tanya explains this. And the reason why it's extremely helpful, I find, and liberating is because many times we try to be something that we can't be. Or we think, you know, everyone's trying to be the, but it's not necessarily your soul's journey. Okay. It's not. So a tzaddik has the potential to be a tzaddik because his soul comes from a world where it has the potential to reach that 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 level but most of us all we have to do is just be the benoni right do, do, you, do you learn tanya mm -hmm. okay so the benoni is the regular person right where you're gonna have desires you're gonna have struggles mm -hmm. your whole life but you're gonna try to come to a place where you can choose right from wrong even though there's always going to be a constant battle underneath that's the way time explains it. I said, I said like five chapters in one yeah, minute, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not saying you need to be tzaddikim, but I think there is space to say that no matter where your soul comes from, if you work hard enough, if you do your own efforts, and Hashem agrees and grant, and He can grant you the ability to be a tzaddik. Yeah, we all I have tzaddik moments. Absolutely. We all have tzaddik moments. It's true. But we don't. You see, in, I, at least in Chabad, I feel like it's very clear as I don't try to be a rebel. You know what I'm saying? Right, I'm not saying that's the goal. I'm that's, but that's what I'm trying to say. Do you understand what I mean? But, but I feel like there is a possibility. Like there's like, you know, To like, become a tzaddik, that means your yes. soul originally has the potential to become a tzaddik. Well, in Tanya, it speaks of different tzaddik. Different, different levels of tzaddik. Yeah. Right. And we all like, have tzaddik moments. True. Yeah. But to fully eradicate your animal soul, to fully transform your animal soul to a godly soul, is that's 
it, I, I, I'm not saying everybody can do that. I'm saying there is a possibility. I'm, I'm saying Hashem didn't create a world where it's not possible for someone who didn't come from that, whose soul didn't come from that source to actually become. I mean, that, I think that's what it says, though. I think it says, you know, let's say David HaMelech. He's a great example because he wasn't born a tzaddik. But he had the potential to become one and he, and he used his potential and he became a tzaddik. That's why it says in Tehillim, the, the Levi Chalal the Kirbi. He says I, he transforms his animal soul into, into something godly. He didn't have animal soul anymore at the end of his life, but that wasn't always. Right? We know that he's sick. Right? But that's because he had the potential to be a tzaddik. But we don't know that. We don't. So hypothetically, you could say that. Of course, we we, I'm not saying don't strive for this, for sure. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know um, who has the potential and who doesn't. And the crazy part is, is that the author of the study told me that, you know, sometimes you look at a tzaddik and you say, okay, he's children for sure could also be. And he's like, no, it could be the most simple couple. Get the soul of a tzaddik. There's a reason behind that, but if I go into that, then it's going to be a whole nother for bringing in. But, um, well, I'm supposed to stop now, right? Yeah. Until the final the comes in and does the smile. Right, right. But mm-hmm. I think she told me this class officially goes to class 15, right? Yeah. Okay, amazing. Okay. Um, Everything so clear you. or are we confused? Can yes. I just, uh, first. No, I just missed the beginning and you have like two words that's like above and below. Yeah, it's a rusa de la sata and it's a rusa de la elo. Arousal from below and arousal from above. And we said that mainly the beginning of elo is amnila That we need to we need to have an arousal from below and God reciprocates that. So we need where we want it. Yes, we want it. We're going to get to the meeting place tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, he comes and meets us exactly where we are. I like the way you said it. Yeah. So we start from below and then. We need to sh- we need to sort of say God I want I I want to be close to you no matter how far you are and no matter how whatever you've done you could have done the worst sin but it's almost like tapping into the pain of your soul and realizing that it's really what does your soul want and tapping into that and okay. and just showing interest you know okay you had a question I had a question we said that this lot of fear it's not really like that. The connection between our effort and the result we get, it's not really like clear, like a great connection. No, I didn't say the effort. It's not, no? No, because the effort does count. I mean to say, of course, the more effort you put in, the more, right? It's like, it's like planting. It's like planting a, 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 a garden, right? If someone just like plants, right, and doesn't really try hard and doesn't do the watering and the whatever, I don't know, I'm not, she's a gardener, but Mm -hmm. I don't know the process, but I'm saying, obviously someone who really puts more effort into their garden is going to have a more more beautiful garden, but at the end of the day, are you the one that made the flower come out? When you put that seed in and you plowed and you watered, someone else has to make the flower come out, and that's God, right? So of course our effort counts, and I think the more effort, the more the prettier the flower God wants to give you. So it's not the effort does count. It's just to know, even when I plant, I know that God is the one that's making the flower come out, not me. Is it possible that a person plants and then nothing comes out? Yes. Very painful. Sounds sad. I know. I know. I think. It's possible and it's not possible. As in like, it's po- I'm saying it's possible because I think that a lot of us experience that, and that's where like the question is, hey, I tried and nothing happened, and this is it, right? I think that maybe there's just we need to tweak it a bit. We need to let go more. You know, like there's a certain amount of control that I still was holding on to, and I'm, I'm looking for the results, and it didn't come, and da da da. Maybe it's because something better. Something there could be so many reasons, but at the end of the day, what's the tester? The tester is how much control am I holding on to, and how much am I giving God? And I think that when you really let go, there's going to be results. I almost want to 
promise it, but I can't. <laughs> because, again, you can't know the work that's being done. But it's almost like God is pushing you more. It's like, oh, you're not seeing results because you didn't fully let go yet. You get what I'm saying? So a lot of times, even waiting for the results is already a sign that I didn't really let go. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, like it's more It's almost like, okay, God, I'm willing to do this, but I'm waiting for results. Like, I know that it comes from you, but like I did my, like, <laughs> so I'm waiting for you to do your job. Exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Okay. Which um, is it again? This right. is uh, Tyra R. Likute uh, Tyra. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Do we give you back this? It's the Alta Rebel, the Valentinian. Do we give you back these people? No, you keep it for tomorrow. And everyone got the English translation, okay? Mm -hmm. Amazing. See you tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday, huh? Oh, so Sunday. In my head, it's Sunday too. I got so scared. I was like, is it? I know. Okay, I won't see you tomorrow. Have a great job, Liz. Do you want to friendly? No. No? Look like that? No, no, no. I know someone in the car's Oh, ask the car, so she's not related. Oh, really?